we begin this year's symposium with a look to the future challenges by Dave Delaney. Dave has been the Vice President and General Manager of Livestock and Ranching Operations for Keene Ranch Incorporated since 2003. Responsibility for 823,000 acres, 25,000 cows, a feed yard, 27 external wildlife leases, and meeting family shareholder expectations, we think qualifies Dave as our leadoff speaker to discuss future challenges of balancing ranch resources. Welcome, Dave. We look forward to your presentation. I appreciate the introduction. The first thought upon being assigned this project by you and Clay was that if I could predict, predict the future, I probably wouldn't need my day job. Uh -huh. However, having said that, Next slide. Wait. We having trouble? Where's it? Okay. Having said that, I'm fortunate to work for a company that actually uh, daily is strategically planning for the future, which I will emphasize more when I go through our, our uh, mission statement and some other things. So my focus today is going to be how King Ranch uh, has prepared themselves for the future to meet these challenges. In doing so, I'm going to talk a little bit about the King Ranch of today, our corporate structure, how ranching and wildlife operations fit in, and some of our 40,000 foot philosophies and how we do that. I'm also going to give some examples of practical application and examples. And finally, I think as many of us already know, some of the challenges that are before us on the horizon. To begin, King Ranch is a diversified land-based agribusiness uh, founded uh, in 1853 by Captain King. We're in our 167th year of existence, which I think uh, speaks to our sustainability. Many people are aware of the King Ranch. We recognize as the birthplace of American ranching with the first quarter horse registered and the largest registry of quarter horses, the first American breed of cattle. Uh, we're a family-owned C-Corps. Uh, that is governed by an eight-person board. We're in our seventh generation. We have over 100 shareholders. The original uh, land purchase I, I'm sitting on now, the Rincon de Santa Gertrudis, is still on the books, as is all the other properties at historical cost. Historical cost. We have ag operations in Texas, Florida, and California. And the home ranch, as you said, is between 125 to 130,000 acres. We're the seventh largest private landowner in the United States. Our operations consist of ranching and wildlife, of which I'm vice president, and report directly to the CEO. We have a South Texas uh, farm, which produces commodity crops, a Florida farm, which produces uh, specialty crops, sugarcane, with the largest citrus producers in the United States. Uh, we're the largest, uh, one of the largest turf grass producers. We have West Coast operations, uh, nut, nut processing and production. Many of you know of the King Ranch Saddle Shop. Uh, we have a King Ranch Minerals Division, which is, is interesting in the way that's operated in that King Ranch divested uh, the minerals directly to the shareholders 40 years or more ago, but yet we have retained uh, executive rights. So that King Ranch has a lot of power over development uh, and location of these facilities on the ranch. And of course, we also have corporate activities. The mission statement of King Ranch I think while I won't read it, shows that one of the functions of all these entities is to preserve the home ranches. As I said, our, fa our King Ranch family is very long-term and they think ge generationally. And as such, they also have an ethic of caring not only for the environment, but the communities in, in which we live. Tying into that is our ranching and wildlife mission statement. And while many people, you know, view King Ranch in a lot of ways, I can assure you that we try to be as efficient and profitable as possible. Basically, sustainability, you know, the one thing that will make this ranch sustainability and last into the future is to remain profitable and pay a dividend. Thus, we're tr always trying to be innovative and find ways to generate profit while staying within the values and ethics Oh, and and, uh, and adhering to the culture uh, culture of the ranch. 
<clears throat> While generally, uh, when we talk of natural resources, we don't think about infrastructure, but I think many people find this interesting. And I would like, like to make the comment that although we're talking about natural resources today, too often overlooked is what it takes to maintain the massive infrastructure. Like many ranchers, uh, it's a thin margin business and we have infrastructure. The biggest thing I see uh, that's a problem with many ranchers is they have small operations and they overcapitalize, which affects not only cash flow in the year at which it occurs, but is also one of those gifts that keeps on giving for many years in the future. So if, if there's a lesson to be learned, I think it is that uh, basically don't kick the can down the road uh, we need, you need to invest not only in your natural resources, but your infrastructure as well. I'd also like to mention that also, as part of actually a, a King Ranch Symposium many years ago, we've developed mission statements for all our operational uh, departments within ranching and wildlife. Each of those has developed key strategies which allow them to operate and fit into the overall mission statement. Uh, I sometimes joke that we have three profit centers and seven or eight cost centers, but I can assure you that King Ranch does all it can to be as efficient as possible in its operations. As I approach this talk, you know, I started with the premise that, you know, basic scientific tenets will remain sound. Many of the things we know and do today will not change in the future. But as Dave Hewitt and a lot of our other speakers will talk, we're, we're constantly gaining new knowledge and, uh, and taking advantage of new technologies. Although there are internal forces such as financial and secession that'll govern strategic approach by ranches, external forces is the fa factor that can be, is most unforeseen and which is most difficult to plan for. One of the amazing things, I've had the good fortune to be in the ranching business for 40 years and managed uh, iconic ranches in both the Panhandle and South Texas, is I've it, more than any other business enterprise I've ever seen, Ranches are extremely diverse. Nobody has ha, operates under the same rules and regulations. All have different levels of diversification and natural resources, and all have different business structures and objectives. One of the things I'd like to address, people come up to me and say, well, you should do this, or you should do that. I think one of the th key things is to realize that what is the ownership private landowners goals? And who are the future landowners and why are they buying property? People buy property for a multitude of re uh, reasons. Right now, recreational value seems to be uh, driving the ship somewhat. Uh, many want to expand for, uh, because they need to grow because of uh, more family or they want to lower fixed cost. And they may want to maximize the returns of a particular segment. Uh, some buy ranches as a rehab project and, and hold for appreciation or they may buy land for appreciation as an investment for future sale. Here at King Ranch, we realize that we need to maximize the returns. And in doing so, we realize also that we must compromise and recognize that multiple enterprises can't be maximized at the same time all the time. And in doing this, we have to realize that we need to balance resources. And those uh, resources are usually driven by financial uh, considerations. As an example, uh, one thing we're doing today is we're converting some uh, areas of high, high quality soils at Alorellis Division from brushlands to, to cropland. These areas had gotten overgrown with 80% mesquite cover, 500 plants per acre, and the uh, internal rate of return didn't justify for cattle use. Now you may say to yourself, well, you lost some wildlife habitat, but it had minimal value in the state it had been, and it'll it will actually help the overall profitability of the operation, which will make us more financially sustainable for the future. As we balance resources, we, we look at cultural, societal aspects, species balance, uh, so that we don't favor one species over the other. As I mentioned earlier, the resource right and the in infrastructure. One of the complications we have also is balancing multiple users. Not only do we have family shareholders, we have commercial hunting, we have tourism, we have uh, border patrol contractors, we have oil and gas activities, and many other uses that we have to manage. Uh, we do this through uh, really uh, stringent policies and procedures and actually have a booking system uh, 
that ensures that uh, people can uh, recreate or uh, travel in their pastures safely. We're okay. One of the things I'd like to point out also is, is part of sustainability that ranches need to deal with uh, the ownership rights and how you engage them. Uh, as I said, we had before we have uh, family members and the chairman of the board, but we also have developed a concept. I have people talk to me all the time about on ranches that they have one family member that shoots the majority of the deer or one family member that uses it more than others. Well, one way we've accomplished uh, and been very successful in dealing with that equitable allocation of resources is we have what's called the Santa Cruz Heritage Society. And in order to be a member, you have to be a direct descendant of Captain King. And there's a board of governors, although the asset is owned by King Ranch Inc. Incorporated, they advise and set rules that, uh, as far as main house and other recreational use. They they work with us on assigning fair quotas to all the members, and they also uh, pay fees for the use of, uh, of that recreational opportunity, whether it's meals, guides, or, or other things uh, uh, for the services provided. This makes this this ensures that the ranch continues to operate profitably and that there's a fair allocation of resources to various members. One of the things uh, we have 167 years of history and probably the first 140 or so, basically all of the ranching income was derived from livestock, at first sheep, quarter horses, cattle. However, in the last 25 years or so, we've reached a point where actually our wildlife enterprises generate more income than new cattle, all the, unless it's a spectacular year of markets. Uh, this isn't an annual income, it's a cumulative income. And you can see from this slide that the cumulative income over the last several years for wildlife has exceeded that of cattle. And we take that into account as we do our long-term strategic, strategic planning and allocation of resources. No operation would be successful unless they had a team that understood the mission statement, how to implement it. Uh, King Ranch has very talented staff, at least uh, one PhD on staff, several with master's degrees. We've also do, uh, divided uh, our areas of responsibility in our area managers into wildlife, cattle, natural resources, support services, and of course, a controller. Uh, one of the things is every one of these area managers is equal in authority and they have clearly detailed job descriptions. If there's ever any uh, antagonistic views, then I, I basically serve as the arbitrator in making sure that uh, decisions that are made are well balanced. As people that know me will say, I'm something of a data-driven nut and that I, I love to collect data and analyze it and take a scientific approach. Uh, Peter Drucker, who is a guru in management, uh, made the statement that when it comes to managing business processes and production processes, unless it's tracked and measured, how do you know it's improving? Uh, King Ranch takes the approach that we use gap accounting, but one thing unique about us is that we have over 80 customized management reports uh, th that we use for benchmarking, those things that make the biggest impact on our operations. Uh, one other thing that I'd address is with many ranch uh, ranches fail to do correctly is we have accurate allocations to the various cost centers. For instance, uh, cattle and wildlife share ad valorem taxes. We allocate depreciation. All the labor is allocated to one of these cost centers. So I think in order to make decisions, people need to know what aspects of their operation are contributing and what the true costs are. Early on in the uh, King Ranch Institute of Ranch Management history, they developed what was known as a balanced scorecard. And although Clay told me that this is somewhat antiquated now and that there's, there's more sophisticated uh, methods of doing this, it's still used and it's still taught at our institute. Uh, our friend Barry Dunn uh, wrote an article that if you Google uh, balanced scorecard ranching, you'll find it. And although it may not be a tool you use, it would, it's a valuable a asset in reading and uh, seeing some of the philosophies of how you can manage multiple enterprises. And in, and in actuality, the King Ranch Institute of Ranch Management was founded based on the fact that these large complex uh, ranches now take an, a systems approach to management. 
as we said, I was, as I said, I, I'm very much data driven and we've built some unique programs on King Ranch, for instance, and these, these are not financial programs, but are based entirely on natural resource management. They incorporate such things as a wildlife survey system, which is based on all 44 uh, surveys over constant transects as well as uh, for various species on the ranch. We use what's called a density-based sustainable harvest model that where we assure that we don't over harvest or that uh, game help uh, populations stay healthy. We can also tell you the animal units on any pasture of any period of time for the last 20 years. It, but all of these tie together to help us make informed decisions. Uh, and. Base, and also I what might mention that several postdocs and PhD research projects have been done based on King Ranch database, which entails, if not hundreds of thousands, millions of lines of data so that we know that the decisions we make can be tracked. I'd like to talk, because they are primary profit drivers, I'd like to talk to you just briefly about our cattle and wildlife enterprises, because this is where most of the conflict can occur. And I realize we have speakers that'll address this later in this symposium. As uh, Rick said, we have a, a purebred and seed stock operation. I tell people that we own our own biggest customer and that's our focus, but we also do have a, a standalone profit center that, uh, supports our genetics. We, our breed, of course, as you know, is Santa Gertrudis. Uh, that's where we do most of our intense selection and, re uh, and research and using a within herd EPD system. But a commercial cow-calf uh, is an animal known as a super cruise, which is a F1 cross between a Santa Gertrudis and Red Angus. And you've probably seen, uh, if you're in the ranching business, you've probably seen those marketed as American Reds as a partnership with the Red Angus Association of America. We run a, we have a stocker program. We've, as you can see, we're vertically integrated, but stockers are used somewhat as a huff and puff when we have available grass, and but we don't usually, but it also allows by not having stockers back up in time of drought so that we have to do less culling on that commercial herd. We also have a feed yard that gives us viable options uh, depending on market volatility. We don't, we're not forced to sell every year. We can retain, we can precondition, we can do other things. Our wildlife and recreation programs are basically based on leasing, which generates about 87% of our income. We also provide nature and burning tours, what I call non-consumptive use and uh, use on the ranch. <clears throat> As regards land use, people often ask me, well, what, what land do you hunt, which don't you, uh, and what land do you graze? All range acres produce wildlife revenue on King Ranch and all range acres graze, are grazed by King Ranch livestock. So it's, it's truly a system. Uh, one of the things that we, that we feel is necessary is to provide public access to the ranch so that people know we can tell our story and they know what we're doing. At uh, uh, visitor center, uh, host over 30,000 guided tour guests for nature, might be nature tours, history tours, uh, birding tours, and other uh, such activities. We also allow commercial hunting on uh, land that's uh, reserved for family use so that we can generate uh, income on those acres as well. It also gives people access and the experience of seeing the King Ranch uh, habitat and what we, what we do. Uh, we also have 68,000 acres on the South Texas farm that's uh, basically cotton and milo, some of which is leased uh, as, as a hedge against commodity prices. Okay. One thing I'd like to point out that's unique to South Texas is the fact that Fred Bryant, the predecessor to Dave Hewitt as the director of Cesar Clayburg, described this as the last great habitat. It's known as many names, the wild horse desert, the Tamalipan Biotic Province and other things, but it's a truly a unique place. It's characterized by very large privately held ranches, the largest undeveloped short saltwater shoreline in the United States, if not the world, and the fact that it holds many uh, unique uh, abiotic and biotic provinces. As an example, you can see here that it's the biodiversity in this area of the country is incredibly diverse. Uh, I'm not gonna go through these numbers that you can see actually we're more bio, uh, biodiverse than the Florida Everglades. And uh, we're at the conjunction of multiple flyways for migratory birds as well as trans migrants. Uh, 
one of the difficulties in managing King Ranch and predicting uh, how many cattle to carry or what wildlife production is, is uh, this is a semi-tropical, uh, semi-arid environment that has the highest standard deviation of rainfall of any such uh, uh, zone in, in the world. Uh, I'd often tell people that we live in a desert punctuated by occasional flood. And you can see the uh, back in 2013, uh, when we see 13 inches of rain, some areas receiving three, that we saw foreign crops, quail uh, numbers decline precipitously. And, and, and we needed, that's one reason we manage and take that to an account when we assign their quotas. Uh, I think if you're in agriculture or wildlife, the most, uh, the best leading indicator you have is rainfall is that is, it is the highest determination of production for both of these. And so we manage accordingly. We're very fortunate in South Texas. Uh, I think our leasing programs are somewhat unique due to the high game densities. Over 40,000 to 50,000 white-tailed deer call King Ranch home. We have 15,000 uh, Nilgai or more. In a good year, we'll have hundreds of thousands of quail and 50 to 100,000 turkey as well as migratory birds. Uh, this allows us to uh, do corporate leasing and that type thing where uh, because of these game densities, which can like for a deer sometimes can reach one to eight or nine acres. Uh, however, in consideration of that, uh, we don't just, while we try to monetize uh, game species to some extent to help pay overhead and preserve, we also recognize the importance of non-game species. South Texas, uh, when, we, when we look at environmental assessments, we have over 35 threatened and endangered species in South Texas. One unique aspect in the bottom right-hand corner, you see the phrygianus pygmy owl. We have over 90,000 acres of oak bots, which, which that animal calls home. And I can assure you that King Ranch operates uh, that area with the sensitivity as, as you would uh, uh, a, a, a game reserve, uh, preserve. It, it, we, we're very conscious of the sensitivity of these type habitats. Uh, one of the biggest problems that we have in planning for the future is the invasion of uh, invasive species, flora and fauna, guinea grass, old world blue stems, uh, Bermuda grass. And you know, we have a species here called Weesatch, which uh, makes me almost look fondly on mesquite. It, it's so rapid. In the last 15 to 20 years, we're not exactly sure why, but it's expanded tremendously. We have long five and 10 year rush treatment plans to deal with that. Uh, so uh, in addition uh, to that, those invasive species, while we generate income from Nilgai, they do have a 75% dietary overlap with white-tailed deer. So uh, it's a very productive species and we need to harvest by one means or another, at least 10 to 15% yearly. Uh, one, uh, the picture in the middle, you might not be able to discern, but that's a Nilgai uh, spore. And if you look closely, you can see there are actually 12 Weesatch seedlings coming out. So if we wonder why Weesatch is spreading so much, that might be an indication. Feral hogs in the state of Texas do over a half billion dollars annually. And that's yeah. one thing Texas Parks and Wildlife and others are looking. How do we control those invasive species? Uh, so. We had a slide. Okay. Let's see here. Okay. Basically, as we as we look at developing management philosophies, we realize that we have limitations and that we basically manage two things. The first of these is habitat, and the second of those is harvest. Uh, habitat means you know how we manage our, uh, our brush and manage uh, habitat management uh, practices for which we spend over two and a half million dollars annually. Water availability for wildlife is extremely important. And when I speak of harvest, I don't even mean selective harvest of, of, ga of game. I also mean the grazing pressure, uh, wildlife. And, and we also look at uh, harvest as non-consumptive uses, which I think Greg is gonna to speak to uh, next and that we see that as a, a growing enterprise. Okay. Key to all of this is recognizing that the potential production is dependent on the ranch of the vegetative community. Uh, as I said, for instance, our oaks where we where the phrygianus pygmy owl resides are grazed seasonally. They're very low production. Uh, some, in some areas, we may only stock one 
to less, to 100 acres or more per acre. We're, we're sensitive to that, but we realize that that's that's the use that we it can best be put to. As excuse me, as we develop plans, we recognize these these vegetative communities. In addition, when we manage on King Ranch, we do it at a pasture basis level. The soils are different. Uh, the species composition is different. So when we do range monitoring, we try to cover within a pasture all of the different sites to be sure that we're getting accurate information as to what the carrying capacity might be and what the wildlife production might be. In addition, uh, we, we manage quotas and access on a pasture basis rather than as a, as a micro unit rather than a micro, uh, macro approach. What are the, one of the things we do too is that, uh, as we talked about habitat management is, we, we make sure that it's balanced use. And so whenever we do a habitat project, the area manager of natural resources, the area manager of wildlife, cattle, and myself have to sign off on those projects to ensure that they're accomplishing the goals we want. In addition, although I didn't show a slide, we have an annual meeting we have an annual meeting on carrying capacity because those can change as well due to brush treatments. We also do follow-up analysis to be sure that the treatments we, uh, we give have been positive. Uh, you can see this is an example in one of the pastures, which has actually been in a drought the last couple of years, hadn't recovered from the historic drought, which ended in, uh, which ended in 2013. And you saw an incredible increase where we had almost two, uh, two quail per acre in some places. So measuring like this tell, it feeds back to us the information we need to make uh, the right decisions. As, as I said before, you can't maximize two in, enterprises. And basically, as we look at species balance, the requirement for general wildlife, regardless of species and those of cattle can be can uh, be in competition. Basically for cattle, you wanna maximize forage production, which is what we call a monoculture uh, and require only another, enough cover for shade. We actually, some of our cattle managers wanna minimize water distribution because it can uh, have no more than one uh, trough or water source within a mile because it eases gathering. However, wildlife have a different, uh, a different requirement. You know, they require some bare ground. Uh, they need forbs, mast and cover. And basically, uh, you know, as rainfall increases, really the cereal stage that, that we manage toward uh, actually decreases, can decrease for the benefit of wildlife if we're not talking about non-invasive species. We're also adamant that we protect riparian uh, areas and that we, uh, we, we protect the habitat in general for, uh, for uh, wildlife. So you can see how that can present uh, challenge between uh, cattle and wildlife. Uh, paramount, regardless of what we're talking about today or in the future, maintaining soil health and range condition is paramount for a rancher. Uh, some of the things we look at is the proper carrying capacity assignments uh, that we analyze uh, annually, as that is the primary determinant, in our, my opinion, of range condition. We also look at, we have the proper grazing systems for the soil type and the production, and that we have flexibility so that drought, we're, we're in drought in this country 30% of the time, so we manage toward the fact that, uh, next slide, that we need to, we need to be able to actually uh, be able to maintain our cattle numbers in, for up to a year in a, in a moderate to severe drought. Uh, we need to allow for brush management practices. As I said before and showed, we need to verify the system and we need accountability in the system. We actually have programs that tie into our cattle inventory report where I can see the uh, AUs per actual versus assigned uh, every time we update our, our cattle inventory system. And as I said before, we manage to a range condition of fair to good. <clears throat> One, we've, we've developed pasture masters, as I said, that analyzes each pasture on an individual basis and sets residual forage goals. Uh, we adjust these uh, on an ongoing basis. As you can see, 
for this particular pasture, historically, we grazed one to 22 acres, and now we're grazing about one to 27. And we're looking at a residual forage of even of 900 to 1,000 pounds. This probably wouldn't have been considered 25 years ago, but due to the importance of wildlife, it's something that uh, we manage toward. Residual forage is extremely important for uh, fawn co fawning cover and quail nesting sites. So that's one example of how we manage with that grazing pressure uh, for the benefit of wildlife. As I said, we spend approximately two and a half million dollars annually on, uh, on habitat. Uh, how, I won't go into this, but we target the most productive soils. Uh, we try to minimize soil disturbance. And we realize now more so than ever that brush, especially in drought, is an important component of providing edge and interspersion for the benefit of wildlife. Fire, many, you know, people say, you know, fire uh, basically uh, is an important tool so that we, we, we don't allow all our grasses to reach a point of, of uh, senescence where they're not capturing carbon and they're not growing for the benefit of either species. As I said, we also protect riparian and sensitive habitat. Finally, as I said, this was about what are the challenges and threats. And I think most of you out there in the ranching industry know that uh, we, we have, these would be some of the external threats uh, that I referred to. First, I think we have a responsibility to educate the public and recruit potential future recreational and hunters so that we have that demand in the future. This is a, uh, basically due to urbanization and uh, the fact that uh, the rural areas have less population, there's political. You know, we need to do a better job of educating the, uh, the public as to the societal benefits that we provide to the public, such as protecting uh, endangered and threatened species at no cost to the public. In fact, we pay taxes in order to do so. Uh, like I said, the demographics are changing. And so we have to, it's imperative that we uh, recruit the younger generation. Also, one of the threats we have is, uh, I think, is the privatization of uh, our native species. I think King Ranch follows the seven tenets of North American game management. And uh, I believe that if you Google that, you'll see that that believes in the public trust document where uh, game species are public, uh, a public uh, asset that are not to be wasted or sold uh, for commercial purposes, as well as other tenants. Uh, fragmentation, I think people talk about pollution. I think fragmentation and urbanization uh, uh, present a threat. Urbanization, not only because of the loss of habitat, but it means more people are from the city and less educated. Uh, political and regulatory effects, Environmental Species Act, all of us, I think, I don't know any rancher that doesn't want to protect an, uh, endangered species, but in Texas, especially when over 95% of the land is basically privately owned, it's imperative that our federal uh, fish and wildlife and other agencies uh, join us in partnerships so that uh, we use the carrot rather than the stick, so to speak. I think we're also unique, uh, Carter Smith will talk later, in that we have, because it is private land, we have a very unique and close relationship with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department that put empower landowners to do the best they can in managing uh, those uh, game species that are in the public trust. Uh, water rights, ad valorem taxes, and landowner rights and incentives are things that we're very keen on. None of us really know all the causes of, of climate change, but we do know climate changes. And when it does, the habitat changes, the carrying capacity and many other things. We have to be aware of that and manage in such a way that the volatility that's likely in the future is accounted for and that our strategic plans and business plans account for this volatility. Uh, I'd mentioned invasive species and one last thing I'd, that we deal with uh, in South Texas is the cattle fever tick. Uh, and there's other diseases which can be interchanged between wildlife and, and livestock, which uh, present a threat that have to be accounted for. Uh, opportunities, though, do exist. We've got a growing world population and protein demand. And ba basically, human and animals are produced on largely unarable soils. They, act, they, uh, they actually, wildlife benefits on these as well. From a technology standpoint, we're actually looking at drones for doing uh, surveys and, and cattle inventories and checking mills and uh, security reason. We see in phone apps that we're actually using for a cowboy shoot side. We have within herd molecularly enhanced uh, where we do DNA analysis to increase breeding accuracies. And 
just the fact that we have such fingertip data processing abilities and storage allows us to review a much wider uh, uh, array of data to make decisions. We also, I think in the future, we're accounting for is non-consumptive uses. We have people that want high quality birding tours. We want to produce exclusive recreational uh, experiences. I also think landowners need to capitalize on the societal benefits they have. I'm not exactly sure how in carbon sequestration and, and you know, rational re renewable energy sources. King Ranch is actually looking at, at some point uh, at some renewable energy possibilities and hope one day to have a zero carbon imprint. It's whether we get there or not, I don't know, but it's something we're going to look at and, and that we're going to try to achieve. And, and there's abilities now to diversify in many ways. And if you're a rancher, knowing those and, and is extremely important. Uh, as I said earlier, education and recruitment also important due to the changes uh, in demographics. But we have an opportunity there to tell our story and develop uh, potential recreational consumers in the future. Some, some final thoughts on our presentation today is that if I had to sum it up, I'd say that as a rancher and as a wildlife manager, you need to remain flexible in your approach and embrace change. So decisions need to be science-based, but we have to realize and can't be so hard-headed to think that public perception is not important because basically that's our consumer and social responsibility and environmental awareness go hand in hand with our responsible ranch management. One of the things I like to say is kind of like the Hippocratic Oath. Whatever we do, we try to do no harm because we do not know what the future may bring. How does it may bring? How does it affect future generations and does it fit our mission statement? And I'd like to say that private land stewardship is key, especially in Texas, to natural resource management. Partnerships between agencies and private landowners are the future of wildlife management, I believe, and are extremely important. Also, we look at what are the implications to other operations. It, is it a balanced approach and is it sustainable? And when I speak of sustainable, I mean that we have both a financial obligation to our shareholders as well as a, an ethic and culture to, uh, to maintain our natural resources for the use of future generations. With that being said, I, I believe I have time, Rick, to uh, answer a few questions. Absolutely, Dave. Thank you very much. And we do have several questions that have come in. Some are big picture and some are specific to King Ranch, and we'll just take those in order of popularity. Uh, the first question is, you listed 30,000 guided tours a year, but did not show its proportional wildlife revenue. So two questions. Do you charge for non-consumptive tours? And second question, have you seen an increased demand for this in recent years? Number one, we have seen an increased demand. The reason I didn't mention it is because it actually, the visitor center actually operates under the retail segment of King Ranch. And I provide the access, but that's not part of my uh, responsibility and oversight. Uh, as of this moment, that as a percentage of income and revenue to King Ranch, it would not be substantial. Uh, it does better than break even. But as I said, we feel we have a social responsibility to allow access. Uh, many of those tours are history tours, not necessarily wildlife tours. Uh, we have a museum and that would include those museum visitors. So uh, I, I hope that answers the question. I do see that, I do see th that with the changing demographic growing, but at the moment I would say the revenues that can be uh, realized from consumptive uses far, uh, far outstrip those that can be realized with non-consumptive, so. Yeah, uh, great. Great. Well, this one's the next question is a little bit uh, kind of a 50,000 foot view question. Uh, what role does climate change play towards ranch management sustainability in the long term? You know, I, I would say we really don't know what the long term effect of climate change are. I think the fact that we manage conservatively and that we analyze the resource on an annual basis from a great uh, grazing standpoint. Um, there's, there's going to be effects. I don't, I don't think we all know completely what they are. I think what climate change is going, is going to really do is add volatility to the system that can't be predicted. You know, I showed you that one year where we had in 2010, 40 some inches of rainfall and the following year we had 13 with some areas is, is receiving as little as three. The reason for that is 
basically because we had two tropical storms in one month the previous year, and then we went a drought of uh, La Nina conditions the following. So I think, I think when I'm dealing with climate change, we're gonna have to remain flexible in our approach and we're gonna have to be analytical and we're gonna have to uh, change our management uh, based on uh, how, how that occurs and what happens. Yeah, great answer. Great answer. The next one goes from 50,000 feet down to shoot side, comes from a fellow rancher. Uh, what iPhone apps are you using or is your staff using shoot side? We're using what we're doing, it's, and it's really not iPhone. Well, it is. It's a pad app, really. Uh, but we're doing, we do animal ID. We actually do our inventories. We maintain a herd age on every pasture in our commercial herd. Uh, in the future, one of the things we're doing uh, that'll start next year is we're going to have every animal within, uh, Tyler's working on a program where within nine years, every animal on King Ranch is to be genotyped. And we're going to actually have built, a, this is just an example, we're actually building a fertility model that includes us settling on bulls. And we're gonna actually go in a multi-bull pasture and be able to determine how many uh, animals and which animals that, where we might have, we have one pasture with 32,000 acres with 700 cows, but you know, that has, you know, th you know th uh, 25 or 30 bulls in it. So we'll be able to tell, we'll actually enhance and increase our ability to do genetic improvement by adding to it uh, within her EPD database. That's one example. Uh, some of the, you know, obviously at a feed yard, basically animals I have, every animal on King Ranch has a unique RFID number. So uh, basically, uh, which will be important for disease, for disease tracking in the future. It's also part of the fact that we produce animals, uh, natural uh, agent source verified animals, which enhance our marketing ability. So as we process animals and we can read that, you know, if they're sold that way, they have to be documented. So uh, we're looking, uh, you know, one thing that we think is gonna be very interesting in the future, we're not gonna have only read only, but we'll have write, uh, read and write ability in these ear tags. So uh, we, I think, We've begun initial, but I think we've only scratched the surface on the potential. Yeah, I totally agree. The technology is changing rapidly uh, and I think affords tremendous opportunity in the future. Uh, this kind of this question kind of is a segue from what you were talking about. The question is, uh, does the operation, meaning King Ranch, handle any international logistics or import and export cattle? You know, we, ha we have on occasion exported semen but uh, basically, you know, uh, basically we have no international livestock operations anymore. And uh, so, you know, one of the things, Rick, I'd like to say is that the world uh, consumer and the world demand is, is entirely different than what, you know, United States is a quality grade oriented uh, beef production system. So we're cognizant of that. There were times this past year where the difference between a, a, a choice and select animal could be $250 or more ahead. And so, you know, we're the only ones that are driven by that grading standard. Having said that, we, we select for 14 within herd EPD uh, phenotypes that are grouped into uh, carcass uh, growth and fertility. And so uh, that's, you know, unless we can buy uh, semen where we have that data, you know, basically we don't utilize it. And, but like I said, we don't export live animals, but we do occasionally export semen uh, if, if there's a demand for it. We don't, we don't focus on that market. It, it, it can be an expensive process, uh, but we're not adverse to it. Yeah, great answer. Uh, this one, you're uniquely qualified to answer. Do oil and gas revenue slash leases affect management uh, abilities and decisions for the ranching and wildlife operations? Well, as I said, you know, back when uh, King Ranch divested the minerals, that's when we really started diversifying uh, operations. And so to me, you know, the fact that we maintain executive rights, I, I can tell you that, you know, th there's very little they do that, uh, that negatively affects us. Uh, because we have executive rights, I've actually moved the location of wells because they were too close to a to a sensitive oak mot that could potentially be uh, owl habitat or, or other things. And so we've had very little conflicts, but I think it does bring up the point that in Texas, when the, when the land and mineral estate are severed, 
that it can be it can be huge problems. And there was at least two Supreme Court cases over the last two years relative to to, to that and, and those uses. But I would say that because of uh, the way the board and the family have handled that over the years, that we're in better position than most to manage that. And in fact, we one of our goals is we require pipelines are coming in, they have to go through existing right of ways. If there's road access, they use existing roads. We have, uh, you know, one, one of the things we are that I'll mention too is we probably have more leverage than a small landowner because we do have a designation of a national historic, uh, a, a nationally historic monument as King Ranch's entirety, which probably gives us some average leverage as we negotiate those type of things. Yeah, great answer, great answer. So this one takes it back to survey and data collection. Uh, does King Ranch survey herds and wildlife using drones? Uh, and if so, would you care to share about that? You know, there's actually company, commercial companies out there that are doing that. We've done some research, uh, some preliminary research with Cesar Clayberg. Uh, I think, you know, these R44 surveys, not only are they expensive, but, you know, helicopters aren't always the safe, safest, uh, you know, <laughs> travel device for our employees. I think it's coming. One of the problems we've seen in drones is we, when we do our surveys, we, we survey a multitude of species. And, you know, distinguishing between a baby calf and a, and a deer or, or a baby nil guy on the ground can be tough. Also, uh, basically, they're, but I, this, they're working on that. You know, one, what, you know I would not call, call King Ranch always an early adapter. You know, we kind of prefer to let other people do the research and work out the kinks. But I definitely see that it, uh, drones are, are likely the way in which we're going to do a lot of these surveys in the future as, as the software is perfected. Yeah, great answer. And uh, this, one of the earlier questions that came in, uh, any acreage on King Ranch high fenced? You know, we, we, we have no enclosed high fences. We have some areas on that northern boundary that we did high fence, but, and the reason was that we had situations where there were 600 acre ranchers that turned into 10 acre ranchers. And we actually did a survey on two miles. There were like 70 feeders within 100 yards of our fence, which made it impossible you know, we, we try to manage deer where we don't take any deer under five and a half years of age. Uh, and so, you know, it was basically impossible. And, and because of people that were having uh, unlogical harvest on small acreages, you know, it was in, interfering with our least these ability to manage the deer herd. And so we have, no, we, we are entirely Boone and Crockett qualified because uh, we, we have no enclosed high fencing just, but we do have maybe, and I couldn't tell you the mileage, maybe 14 miles, but we have a 600 mile boundary, you know, if you look at the entirety of King Ranch, so. Yeah, um, great answer. Um, you, you talked uh, just briefly, you, well, you mentioned habitat management. Uh, and so the question that I have for you is, when it comes to habitat or brush management, I know you have a large budget, but in South Texas is, Habitat management, a once and done or never ending management decision? A absolutely not. It is a process. You know, in fact, I tell people when if you disturb the soil, all you do is make it mad and you get multi stem regrowth of mesquite. It, and, you know, you get we satch. And when you disturb the soil, we satch loves disturbed soil. The only time we use those kind of treatments is when the brush canopy has become so excessive that it's neither productive for cattle or wildlife. We've actually uh, seen instances where we had seven, 8,000 acre pastures. And I, I didn't really mention it, but those areas that have a 70, 80% uh, percent brush canopy may only be producing two or 300 pounds of forage per acre. We've actually done measurements where we came out and root plowed and chain and we're doing, uh, we're producing 4,000. So we've had pastures where we've uh, root plowed less than 25% of it, but it, we're able to increase the stocking rate 40% or more and increase the residual forage within that pasture at the same time. So uh, it's absolutely not one and done. We have over 26 potential applications that we can use. And when we sign off, when we sign off on that initial treatment, it includes the follow-up treatment, the timing and the methodology. And of course, the cheapest you can do is burning to uh, set back the uh, seedling invasion but that, that, because of fuel loads uh, and a lot of other factors, that can be uh, the ability to, to utilize that. You can't depend on it entirely. 
Yeah, great. Uh, we got about two minutes left, so this will be the final question for Dave. And I apologize to those of you that uh, have submitted questions that we're not gonna, time's not gonna allow us to get to. Final question, Dave, do you, does King Ranch use any grazing management software or digital mapping platforms to manage herds and pastures? You know, the, the RAP system, we're looking at that, we're not using it. Our grazing management system is completely custom. In fact, we're rewriting it. It was based on an AS400 Infinium processor system. And we've actually recently converted to Oracle and we're actually in the process of converting over. So it was custom, it was custom design. We do use GIS, we do use some GIS, but one of the things we're, lo uh, we're looking at is I think the drones are gonna allow us to do is actually there's gonna be software developed that lets us estimate herbaceous mass on an ongoing basis in a pasture. I think that's one of the technologies we're gonna be using. Uh, and, and, you know, so uh, we do work with NRCS. Uh, we're actually doing a customized, because we have so many pastures and so much acres, we can't do the pure NRCS uh, pasture uh, evaluations. And we're looking at a hybrid system at developing that. And all of that data is, is kept. It, it's it's not it. We have GIS locations of all of these places, but they don't necessarily tie in. I think that's something that we're gonna are gonna have in the future, though. Awesome. Well, Dave, thanks for taking time from your busy schedule and for sharing your perceptions of future challenges. I think it was an excellent start uh, to this year's symposium.